husband and this administration are also committed to making sure no one is left behind and forgotten men and women are not forgotten no more. The guests we have with us today are shining examples of how we can uplift our communities. Businesses, large and small, are represented at this event. Each of them share a commitment and understanding that economic empowerment and the feeling of purpose play an important role in creating sustained sobriety. These are the facts of recovery at work, and I'm inspired by each of your stories. You are not just job creators, you empower the human spirit. I want to thank all of you again for your outstanding work in making our communities a much stronger and accepting place for all Americans. Thank you very much. And now I would like to turn back over to Director Carroll. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Trump, for your continued dedication to this cause. I have a great honor now of introducing you to some new friends, but these are friends of mine that are here today. And, but I think it's only fitting that we start with prayer. And so the first friend that I would like to introduce everyone to is Reverend Jan Brown. And Reverend Brown is the Executive Director of the Global Recovery Initiatives. She's the Executive Director of the Spirit Works Foundation. She serves as the Chairperson of the Board of Directors of Faces and Voices of Recovery, which we'll hear more about in a few minutes. And she's also been appointed by the Presiding Bishop of the Episcopalian Church to serve on the Commission of Impairment and Leadership. Reverend Brown, would you please lead us? Let us pray. God of all creation, we give you thanks for this glorious day. We give you thanks for the opportunity to come together, to listen to one another, and to share hopes and dreams and possibilities as they relate to issues of recovery in the workplace. We know that purpose and meaning are pillars of recovery. Help us be faithful stewards and intercessors for all in need of meaningful work, engaging with goodwill in this spirited dialogue. We ask that you allow the conversation to unravel organically, that our differences not get in the way, that we be fully present or we are here to do your work in this world. We know that in you all things are possible. Kindle in us your holy fire to allow us to be brave and bold and courageous around this important topic. We pray for those who continue to suffer with COVID-19 and their families and friends and those who are caring for them. We pray for those who are struggling with economic, financial, health, racial, and housing insecurities and ask that you be with them to remove their fears and increase their reliance on you. We give thanks for the celebration of Recovery Month, honoring the millions of lives that have been restored because of recovery, the families that have been reunited and the communities that are now thriving. We know that there are many in our midst who continue their struggles. Be with them now. Let them know that you are ever present and only a breath away. We pray for those who have died from overdose and other addiction-related causes. We pray for treatment centers, advocacy organizations, recovery organizations, and all those working to end and to serve those who are in or working toward recovery. Throughout this difficult season of COVID-19 and the ongoing addiction epidemic, remind us to maintain and celebrate our connections. Help us to always remember that we are the face and voice of recovery in this country and beyond. We pray for the leaders gathered here that you would inspire us to find solutions that promote health and healing for all who have been affected by substance use disorders and any other addictions and that you would equip us with the will and the skills to make those solutions a reality. Continue in us the good work you have begun. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Brown, for that beautiful prayer. And when we first met, one of the first things that I did was ask her to pray for me and for the office on this issue, that we could continue to be led and guided to do the right thing. 
And so in addition to faith leading us, and of course the First Lady being the North Star to always do the right thing, we've also been blessed at the White House with Larry Kudlow. Yes. You, that's, <laughs> he's, he should be smiling, but I don't think that he is right now. Um, in addition to being always a calm and reassuring voice, and as the lead for the Economic Council here, and the leading person really in the United States on economic issues, Larry is well known to all. But one thing I don't think is very well known, and I sincerely appreciate Larry coming forward today to be part of this, but Larry just celebrated his 25th year in recovery. And so Larry, congratulations. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Appreciate it very much. Um, many thanks to the First Lady. Uh, I am Larry Kudlow. I just had a 25th uh, sober anniversary on uh, July 1. And I, I don't want to say too much. <clears throat> My story has been out there for, for many years. Um, I would just say that when the President and the First Lady um, offered me this position, which is the greatest honor of my professional life. And I've stayed a lot longer than probably a lot of people thought I would. Uh, it would not have been possible. It would not have been remotely possible. It would have been unthinkable that I could occupy such a job um, 25 years ago. Unthinkable. Um, I was a hopeless abuser of alcohol and drugs. I had tried several times unsuccessfully to get sober. Like a lot of my peers and friends, I went through bloody hell and suffered significant consequences. I'm not alone. Most of us had the same troubles. And um, I was unemployable. But by the grace of God, I, I did stay married. My wife is a saint, Judy. I've said that before, I'll repeat it. We've been married 34 years, it's a miracle. But it was difficult. The whole story was difficult. Having said that, I will offer this. It is because of my stubbornness and willfulness and the difficulties and consequences, and the fact that I had to learn how to change my behavior and follow a few simple steps or guidelines. Um, I believe sincerely today that it probably was the best thing that ever happened to me because it forced me to change and seek a new path and return to faith. I might not have said it at the time, but more and more I've come to realize it down through the years. And so it's an honor for me to be with fellow suffering alcoholics and employers. And I will just say to you, you know, you will, you can get sober. You can. For those who are still sick and suffering, you can. It's not easy, but you can get sober and you can stay sober and you can lead a productive life. And most importantly, hopefully like myself, we can learn to help other people get sober and stay sober so they can be productive and contribute to society and to life. I think it's a phenomenal thing that the First Lady has engaged herself in this battle. Phenomenal. But you're pretty phenomenal. And you know I've said that and actually written that in columns down through the years. So it is my pleasure and honor to be here with you today. The President has been remarkable. I've known him many years. He brought me into this position. I didn't ask for it. I've served him to the best of my ability. He's been remarkable to me. Accessible, 
We have great discussions, sometimes even debates. He's a remarkable man. And um, if I get time off for good behavior and, and write another book, I'm going to write about that, because I sincerely believe it. But I'll also say this. Drawing from what the First Lady said about loneliness and sadness, there's nothing as bad as that. You're trying to do good, but you can't. And for me, and I will kind of borrow, paraphrase from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, it became clear and clear in my life that I was a hopeless alcoholic. And it also became clear in my life that no human power could restore me to sanity. But I learned, finally, that God could and would if he were sought. And I sought him. Whether it's a higher power or some religious power, the fact is I had to acknowledge my problems, my frailties, my powerlessness over drugs and alcohol and just start over with the help of others. And to this day, and I mean this truly, to this day, in my personal life, I don't make a single significant decision alone, because I have a track record of making bad ones. Instead, I go to my friends, my sober friends, and my wife, to get advice and suggestions, and then I follow them. And that's worked for me. It may or may not work for you. I just put it out there. But it's worked for me. Left to my own devices, it was ugly. But leaning and following the advice of others and their sober wisdom has worked for me. And I'm here helping out with our team. And you two can do exactly the same thing. I don't care what you do for a living. It doesn't matter. This is a disease that uh, uh, has remarkable equality. No matter who you are, you can get it. And I got it. Um, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about my alcoholism there isn't a day that goes by that I don't read my daily meditation and prayer in the morning. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't call or text one of my AA buddies. And there isn't a day that goes by that I don't say the serenity prayer. Not a day for 25 years. Why? Because I have to. That's all. I need to be reminded of the main issue, which is my sobriety. I may have good forecasts or bad forecasts. I may give the president good advice or less good advice. But the one thing I do, without exception, is go through my meditations and the serenity prayer. And oftentimes, if things get a little intense around here, just occasionally, I will say the serenity prayer again. It works. It works if you work it. I hope you know that familiar phrase. God bless all of you. Um, I'm blessed. I'm lucky, but I'm blessed that I discovered God, that I discovered a higher power, that I discovered 12-step programs, and that I'm able to help out my fellow alcoholics, my fellow countrymen, to give service. It really is the pinnacle of my life. I'm an old guy that came late, but it's been great, honestly. It's been great. My worst day, <laughs> my worst day, the president can be yelling at me or something goes wrong, I, it doesn't matter, whatever. My worst day now is better than any day I had before I got sober. And I mean that sincerely. So you can do it. And to the employers who are here and others, um, Give us a chance.
please. Give us a chance. That's all we ask. And we will try to own up to our responsibilities and stay the road, stay the path, stay on the right road, and help you. I think recovering alcoholics make great employees, myself. <laughs> and that's what makes it such a great thing that the First Lady uh, and my pal Jim and Jerome have come to help in whatever capacity we're here, official, personal, whatever. It's very rare for people to do this, what you're doing, ma'am. So we love you for it. We really appreciate it. And uh, if you'll permit me, I'll just end with this thought. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The wisdom to know the difference. God bless all of you. And um, let's all stay on the happy road of destiny as sober men and women. Thank you, ma'am. You can see where we all love Larry and love having him here. We're also blessed to have someone in the administration, and I'm so blessed to have him as a friend. We have the nation's doctor who is firmly committed to safeguarding the lives of all Americans. Dr. Jerome Adams also, like all of us at this table, and I think like so many of all Americans, understand what addiction can do to families. The pain that it has caused, sometimes at a funeral, sometimes at a hospital or a treatment center, or sometimes at a jail cell. And so we're blessed not only to have his expertise, his phenomenal medical training, but someone who understands the issue and someone that I can call, as I frequently do on his cell phone, um, to say, Jerome, what should we do? And he's always answered that call. And before I let you speak, one of the first things that you did was recognize the importance of naloxone. And I see you have it sitting in front of you. And for the first time in 13 years, he issued an advisory to talk about this issue. So I now would like to introduce my friend and a friend to all Americans our Surgeon General, Dr. Jerome Adams. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here today to lift up the lives uh, that have been affected by substance misuse all across our country, especially during this incredibly unique and challenging time. I'm happy to be here alongside my federal colleagues. And I got to tell you, three years ago, uh, when I took this job, uh, I would have never predicted that two old white guys, Larry Kudlow and Jim Carroll, <laughs> would be two of my best friends at the end of all this. But they truly, truly are. And I, I also have to give a shout out to the passionate and compassionate leadership of our First Lady. Do you know how special it is to have a First Lady visit women who are in a neonatal abstinent syndrome clinic? That, that's powerful. When we talk about busting stigma, that was a moment that I will just never forget and I will always appreciate and thank you for because as Larry has said, far too many people for far too long have felt unheard and you made so many people across the country feel worthy and feel heard simply by your presence. So I just wanna thank you for that. And I'm so happy to see the depth and breadth of organizations around the table and coming together here and every day to curb the many epidemics we're facing in this country, viral, chronic disease, and of polysubstances. As you all know, September is National Recovery Month, and while the observance itself only lasts uh, a month, it sends an important message that should serve as our guiding light all year long. That message, the one Larry powerfully just, uh, just helped us become a little bit more familiar with is that recovery is possible. It's a message that I try to carry with me everywhere as I meet with individuals in recovery, as I meet with their loved ones, and health professionals and community members seeking to provide support. In many of those conversations, I see firsthand the powerful results when individuals fighting addiction are connected 
to care and provide the, provided the sustained support they need on the road to recovery. Uh, I'm glad to see my buddy Larry here for another reason, and that's because something I've always emphasized is that public health has sometimes overlooked a key linkage in recovery, the workplace. Even if it's virtual as it is right now, I'm convinced the workplace remains a critical component of support to those who are struggling with addiction. An estimated two-thirds of individuals who misuse opioids are employed. I remember visiting Fort Wayne, Indiana, and their health commissioner telling me that 70% of the overdoses in their county were among people who were employed. Given how much time employees spend at work and the powerful grip of addiction, it is possible and likely that many of these individuals will turn to substance misuse while on the job. The substance misuse rates in key industries are very high, such as the accommodations and food services industry, construction and mining, and SAMHSA's data tells us that one in five employees in the accommodations and food industry report illicit drug use in the last month. One in five. Substance misuse and addiction is not only harmful to our health, but it also leads to absenteeism, high turnover rates, workplace injuries, and reduced performance on the job, and it's why we must address it holistically. On the other hand, and this is critical, we know that gainful employment is an important part of getting and staying healthy. Along with stable housing, having a meaningful and adequately paying job is one of the best predictors of successful recovery. And I visited places like Belden, like Grayston Bakery throughout the country that give people a chance to work and have found that as Larry has exemplified, they are often the most loyal and consistently productive employees that a company has once you give them that chance. We know that having healthy employees, workplaces, and communities helps our businesses thrive. And what's good for health, both mental and physical, is good for business. An important and still too often missed touch point for recovery is when individuals overdose. That's why my office, as Director Carroll mentioned, is focused on putting the lock zone in the hands of community members in an effort to reduce opioid-related overdose deaths. In April 2018, got mine. fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. In April 2018, I issued the first Surgeon General's advisory in more than 10 years, highlighting the importance of naloxone and how we can use it to help curb opioid overdose deaths. And uh, if Secret Service doesn't kill me, I'm gonna demonstrate to the First Lady how <laughs> to use naloxone. Put your finger over it like that and you get the push, so. Give us a push. That's literally how easy it is to save a life. That is how easy it is to save a life. Any of us can do it. Use. One time use, yes. That's the intranasal form. This is the uh, auto injector form. Since the beginning of this administration, we've seen a more than 400% increase in the lock zone dispensed. And this amounts to real lives saved in communities across the country, thanks to all of you, because we put the word out we demonstrate good behavior, but you all are the ones that are making it happen on the community level. And I know first responders have made great strides to make sure personnel carry naloxone while on duty. So I'm grateful to ONDCP and CDC for formulating guidance for our frontline heroes, including law enforcement and firefighters in delivering this life-saving drug while staying safe from COVID-19. I want you to hear me say this, COVID-19 is not an excuse to not deliver naloxone to someone who you suspect of having an overdose. It is a low risk endeavor to deliver naloxone to someone, but it, there is a high chance that you could save a life. It's also important that we encourage those beyond our traditional first responders on how to use and to carry naloxone, including employees, employers, teachers, coaches, parents and friends, and first ladies. Speaking of engaging in, and working with new and non-traditional partners. I'm also committed to working diligently with communities to address the opioid crisis from multiple angles. Any of you all remember this guy called C. Everett Coop? One of my predecessors, he looked a little bit different than me. He was a little bit older, <laughs> had a big gray beard. Well, in the 80s, he put out a pamphlet called Understanding AIDS to every household in America. Anyone remember that? Detailing ways that everyone could get involved to stop the uh, HIV epidemic. The opioid crisis calls for a similar approach, 
but my office took a 21st century slant and issued a digital postcard to educate Americans about the opioid crisis. The postcard provides tangible actions that every single citizen can take to raise awareness, prevent addiction, and stop op opioid overdose deaths. And I hope you'll visit my website at surgeongeneral.gov, download the digital postcard, and share it with your loved ones, share it online, share it through your social media channels. In addition to the postcard, encourage others to share their stories, as Larry has done, in an effort to educate and to reduce stigma. We know addiction is complicated, and we must work to help everyone understand that it is a disease and not a moral failing, and that it can happen to anyone. Reducing stigma can lead to better health outcomes, but if we don't, I remain convinced that stigma is and can continue to be one of our biggest killers. Unless our loved ones and their families feel comfortable seeking help, we'll never be able to get it to those who need it the most. And that's why I also want to give a shout out to First Lady Burgeon from North Dakota, who's been very public with her story. That's how you bust stigma, with a First Lady of the United States visiting moms with substance use disorder, by a First Lady of North Dakota sharing her story, with Larry Kudlow uh, in the powerful position that he's in, sharing his story of recovery. And I personally know the effects of how substance misuse and addiction can hurt not just the individual, but their entire family, friends, and broader community. There's really an individual suffering from addiction. There's a community around that individual who is also suffering. And my own baby brother, Philip, struggles with mental illness and self-medicated to cope. The good news is that together we've made headway in improving treatment for substance misuse. And my little brother has more of a chance than what people have had in the past. While treatments and services are increasingly available and accessible, we still have far to go to ensure that every person, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, or geography, receives the support they need to recover. And like many of you, I want to help uh, not just turn the faucet off, or to turn the faucet off, not just mop up the flood. We must all continue promoting and investing in interventions that prevent addiction in the first place by treating mental health conditions and integrating medical, uh, mental and physical health, by raising awareness of and working to prevent adverse childhood experiences, by promoting trauma-informed care. Far too often we re-traumatize people when they come to us at their low points, and by working to prevent youth misuse of any and all substances that have been shown to impact brain development, including vaping, including marijuana use, including alcohol misuse. So in closing, I'd ask that you please join me in this important work and continue your efforts to empower and enrich our communities, one person, one family, one workplace, one nation at a time. I know we can do it. The proof is around this table. We just need to help everyone else understand addiction is a disease and not a moral failing, but recovery is possible. Thank you. Thank you, General Adams. He stole my thunder a little bit. Um, I now have the honor of introducing another friend from North Dakota, the First Lady. First Lady Burgum has been an outspoken advocate for those who sometimes don't have a voice. And as she celebrates 18 years in recovery, what she is doing is making sure that folks not only back home in North Dakota are able to escape the stigma of addiction Working with her husband, the governor, they're able to find employment. They're able to restart their lives as First Lady Trump has instructed us to do to keep the light turned on to make sure that those people know that they have a home. And thanks to the employers in North Dakota and as evidence here at the table across the country. And so as the First Lady and as the Chair of the North Dakota Office of Recovery Reinvented Advisory Council, I'd love to introduce you all to my friend, the First Lady of North Dakota, Catherine Bergen. Thank you, thanks so much.
Director Carroll, um, I'm so grateful and honored to be with you all today. Uh, thank you so much for including me in this important discussion, and thank you for the incredible work the Office of National Drug Control and Policy does to support and care for so many people across our nation. And thank you, First Lady, for your incredible Be Best initiative, um, especially your focus on opioids, and also your uh, commitment and call to action around helping to eliminate the stigma of the disease of addiction. So as everybody knows, September is Recovery Month, and as uh, Director Carroll mentioned, um, I am 18 years now in long-term recovery from alcohol addiction, and I am deeply grateful for that because I too, like Larry, uh, would not be here today at the White House. Uh, I don't know where I'd be without my recovery, so I'm deeply grateful. My struggle with addiction started when I was young, when I was in high school, and followed me for 20 years of my life, uh, including eight years of relapsing. Two things were really important to me in finding recovery. One was asking for help, and the second was a, an incredibly supportive work environment and a deeply understanding team leader that was pivotal in helping me find recovery. When I became First Lady, I decided to share my addiction and recovery story uh, publicly, which I had not done before, and at that point I had 15 years of recovery. That led the governor and I to start an initiative called Recovery Reinvented, which actually started as a one-day event focused around eliminating the stigma of addiction, but has really morphed into a statewide initiative with a lot of people focused on a lot of efforts around eliminating stigma. Those early years that we've hosted the conference, we've had over three years now, we really had a, a population and, and an audience that was already deeply engaged in behavioral health and recovery and addiction. We decided to pivot and focus, about a year ago we decided this, and focus on um, corporate America, a non-traditional audience um, that could really make a big, if, a big impact in eliminating stigma. So um, this year at Recovery Reinvented, um, one of our initiatives, we have another recovery, our fourth Recovery Reinvented will be happening this year um, on October 28th. It's all virtual, but our initiative is, one of them is um, focused on um, eliminating the stigma of addiction and building recovery support in the workplace. So, um, so when we pivoted to this a year ago, I decided that in my speaking engagements, I would focus on businesses um, and I would focus on eliminating this, the stigma of addiction. So I spoke to two really big audiences. One was the Chamber of Commerce um, for all the little cities across the state of North Dakota. And the second was at the Amazon Web Services Public Sector Summit. And then I decided to, at those events, ask people to stand with me and be a face and voice of recovery at these big business events, which you could have heard a pin drop in those rooms when I asked people to stand with me, and people did. And then there was thunderous applause and support for those people, and that's really what a recovery-friendly workplace should be like. It should be an environment where there's no shame in admitting that you're in recovery and that you're a face and voice of recovery or that you're a person that's struggling and, need, and might need help. In North Dakota, we are all in on the concept of, of peer support specialists or peer recovery specialists. And there are two reasons why we're all in on that concept. And one, it's because 50% of our state is rural and we're never gonna have all the behavioral health services that we need to reach people struggling in all corners of our state. And two, because it's a career path. It is a career path for people that have uh, struggled with uh, the disease of addiction or behavioral health and have criminal backgrounds um, and cannot uh, find jobs. So it is a career opportunity also. We have 472 people trained in our state as peer support specialists. We have a certification for them and Medicaid reimbursement is now in effect for that service in our state. At this Recovery Reinvented uh, event that we're gonna have on October 28th, we are focused on one, uh, we're focusing on a lot of people. We celebrate people that do things differently related to helping other people who struggle with the disease of addiction. This year we're focusing on a company called Solid Comfort, which makes furniture for companies like um, Marriott, Hilton, um, Wyndham, and Best Western. 75% of their current 
employees either struggle with addiction or have criminal backgrounds or been incarcerated. So they attract this underdeveloped and underutilized pool of candidates through their program called Solid Start. They actively recruit team members that were incarcerated. Uh, they participate in job fairs behind the prison walls. They maintain relationships with probation and parole officers, local judges, and drug court administrators to keep that steady pipeline of people coming to uh, work at their location. They believe that the greatest benefit isn't about good business for them, it's about communities they serve, helping empower people with second chances to remake their lives. And they know that when we all do better, we all benefit. So in closing, I believe the two most impactful recommendations that I can make today to support building recovery-friendly workplaces are, number one, encourage businesses to contract with peer support specialists as an extension of an EAP program. And number two, have senior level executives and managers focus on eliminating stigma by talking openly about addiction and mental illness which can turn into a culture of openness and a safe environment for employees to talk about the issues that they face. It starts at the top level. It's not only a human resources function to create culture in organizations. So thank you again for inviting me to be a part of this discussion today. Mrs. Topper, I don't know that I've ever mentioned this, but I was working in the West Wing for your husband in another capacity, and I started working behind the scenes with Kellyanne Conway on this issue. And I realized this position was open. And as I did mention publicly about two and a half years ago, I'd had a, my wife called me, and it turns out we had a family member who needed to get in detox that day. And so I knew that I wanted to get into this position. And when I met with the president, his parting words to me after talking about this issue and we spoke about his brother Fred, who had died of this, his parting words as I left the Oval Office and we were talking about saving lives, he said, be relentless. And it was, it's been my charge to my staff um, to be relentless on this. And the next person that I want to introduce is someone who really epitomizes that and has lived up to the charge of being relentless. Um, even though she didn't know the president told me to say that, um, it's someone that I think she has done that um, every day. And Patty McCarthy, the CEO of Faces and Voices, is, some, is a person in long-term recovery. And when I took the job and came over, they said the first person that I need to meet because she is truly the national spokesperson for people in recovery. She's been an ally in getting key legislation passed. She's been an ally in making sure that those folks are heard on Capitol Hill and that they're heard here at the White House. And so I'd now like to introduce my friend, Patty Metcalf. Patty, thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon and happy Recovery Month. It's great to be here. I am Patty McCarthy and I am a woman in long-term recovery. And for me, that means I have not used alcohol or drugs in over 30 years. And I say that because if it wasn't for my recovery, I certainly wouldn't be here sitting with all of you at the White House, or I would not be the mother and grandmother and uh, employee and employer and taxpayer and voter that I am today. So if it wasn't for the opportunity to get into recovery, um, I wouldn't have the gifts I um, have experienced here, but um, just want to say a big shout out and thank you to the First Lady for your very thoughtful remarks and support of the recovery community and um, for Director Carroll for uh, always supporting us in the recovery advocacy movement and faces and voices of recovery. I was. Uh, it was uh, a, quite a surprise last November when I got a, a phone call from Director Carroll on my 30-year anniversary. So uh, very, very, very nice to, um, to hear always. Um, I just wanted to say that Faces and Voices is incredibly um, grateful to be part of this discussion. And, and uh, we've been around for over 20 years uh, leading a uh, advocacy movement of the grassroots recovery community. So people in recovery 
family members, friends, allies, all, everyone here who supports recovery. And it's an incredible movement that has, uh, represents over 23 million Americans that have, are in recovery. And we've grown internationally. We have uh, Faces and Voices of Recovery Canada, Brazil, South Africa, uh, United Kingdom. So the uh, recovery advocacy movement is incredibly strong and we want, we, we encourage everyone to get involved. Um, I work with an incredible team of people who uh, are um, dedicated to uh, bringing awareness, fighting the stigma, eliminating the, and fighting for the rights of people in recovery, particularly around employment and housing and, and criminal justice issues that have often been a barrier for people in recovery to find, um, to, to find the help that they need and to live productive and meaningful lives. So our, um, we, again, we, we, uh, we work to organize and mobilize the, the recovery community across the nation. I've visited so many grassroots organizations and individuals that have been telling their stories at the local level, and that's why it's so important that we step up and um, be part of the conversation, that people in recovery are part of the solution. And we know that recovery is not only possible, it's not only probable, but it is the expected outcome when the appropriate treatment and recovery support services are made available. So we will continue to fight for that at every level in communities and in and, 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 and federal uh, legislation on Capitol Hill. So. Um, bringing together the recovery community is just, it's, it's a pleasure to uh, work with so many individuals that have been impacted by addiction and particularly the work of organizations that are supporting the children and the children who, who are the, the, biggest, um, the biggest winners when, when, when parents find recovery. So I'm um, very grateful to be here and, uh, and thank you very much. Mrs. Trump, I know you have another obligation to go to. Well, I have a surprise. I changed my um, schedule. Oh my so gosh. I changed my schedule, so I want to hear the stories. I read the amazing biographies of these people, so I want to stay and hear from you. So oh my gosh, that's story. great. Thank you. You can see why we're so blessed to have Mrs. Trump as the First Lady and so dedicated to this issue. Um, you know, Larry, you, you said a minute ago, you know, that we're, you're in the Oval Office and the President raises his voice at you. We've never had that. I really don't know what it's you're talking about. It's just you, Larry. Yeah, it must just be you, Larry. Um, the toughest person in the room, really, for me to win over probably was Mrs. McCarthy. Patty, you know, I, I think, wasn't sure when I came in whether or not I was going to uh, be the advocate, but having a family member um, and having you with Philip um, and having a family member. Um, and Patty's not shy about, I, I said I'm not shy about picking up the phone and calling Dr. Adams. Patty's not shy about picking up the phone and calling me. The, that, that's a compliment, actually. <laughs> um, so at our office, it is important that we have people like the folks we've introduced so far nearby to make sure that we're doing the right thing. But it's also critical to make sure that here at the White House, in my office, that as the principal drug advisor of the president, that we have people much closer by to me who can make sure that I'm doing the right thing. And so to begin the next part of the panel is one of those people and my colleague Peter Gamond, um, who's been working at the Office of National Drug Control Policy for 10 years and is a person in long-term recovery. And before Peter begins, I'd also just like to recognize that we have other people in the audience today who might not be at the table, but who work at the White House who have been on the other side of recovery. But they're here today, and they know that recovery works. We have also have parents here who have lost a child, and we know how difficult this must be. But we're blessed with Peter, um, who's not particularly shy either about making sure that um, I'm doing the right thing for people in recovery. And so, Peter, if you could take over the next portion um, so the First Lady and I can listen, that would be fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, well, my name is Peter. I'm a person in long-term recovery. 
And that for me means, among other things, that I could be sitting at a table like this today. And I think a lot of us can imagine how far away that might have seemed at certain points in our own experience. Uh, what I'd like to do today is for everybody who hasn't been introduced so far, if you could just quickly introduce, tell us your name, tell us the organization you work for. No long introductions, because we want to keep the time so we can talk, talk about the issues, talk about what works, what doesn't. So why don't we start uh, right here with you, Douglas Kirker, Mr. Kiker. Hi, I'm Doug Kiker, and I'm here representing um, Retrofit Careers, now EcoveryCareers.com. And um, I'm an employer. I've been in the construction business for uh, 36 years, and I'm also in recovery. And in that time, I have put a lot of people to work that are in recovery, and I can tell you people in recovery make great employees. Um, so, uh, I've been doing this on my phone at night, and uh, I po spoke to my co-founder over there at the end about it, and he said, well, why don't we start a website? And we looked around because we thought there had to be a website dedicated to putting people in recovery to work with people who were interested in hiring those people, and uh, there was none. So we started a company called RetrofitCareers.com. There's uh, been several challenges uh, to bring employees, to bring in employers, and to let people know we're here. Uh, I'm in construction and Dan's in sales, and um, we funded this by ourselves so far. But uh, I have a lot more to say about it. But uh, in the in the in the, in the uh, interest of time, I'll uh, concede. Thank you very much, and it's an honor to be here. And thank you very much. We can go right down the line. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, my name is John Moser. I'm with Tony Lukes in Philadelphia, if you can't hear by my accent. Um, we have the Recovered Futures Initiative. The reason we started this after witnessing the stigma surrounding addiction derail his son's career aspirations, compromise his sobriety, and ultimately cost him his life. Tony Luke Jr., standing behind me, and Tony Luke's The Brand, pledged to establish an initiative designed to empower the professional lives of those in recovery. We have a franchise system, and we are working diligently to bring people through recovery into ownership of their own franchise. We believe that the stigma of addiction, well, we seek to aid these individuals developing confidence, job experience, professional skills that dispel the unemployable rumor. These make our long-term goals doable. Um, Recovered Futures believes that the social stigma surrounding addiction is the primary barrier standing between those in recovery and the realization of their full career potentials. So we're working diligently to bring people through and, and actually own their own businesses through um, uh, some very hard work and we're starting to get some help from our state level. So we're very excited and uh, Mr. Carl's been awesome also. Thank you. And um, I don't, Tony didn't wait, but Tony, um, we're, we're blessed to have Tony here, and I know you do all this in memory of your son, um, and we had the great opportunity to meet when I came up there. When I, I've been on the road, I eat at too many places, whether it's Nally Fresh or Tony Luke's. Um, I'm sure my doctor here is going to tell me to, to watch my, what I I've eat. I've been known to have some Tony Luke's during my time, too, yeah. so, uh, in moderation. <laughs> I just want to really quickly say that, that you brought up a very important point, and that's not just employment, it's gainful employment and a pathway forward, because what I've experienced as I've gone around the country is employment is important and it's the first step, but far too many people in recovery are chronically underemployed, I and that leads to frustration and anxiety and depression and a feeling, feeling like they can't get out of the hole. And so I, I just really wanted to highlight that and say thank you for for creating that pathway 
that pipeline. You got to get in somewhere, but you got to have a vision for where you can be. And thank you for recognizing that. that to, the, to us, that's the very essence of what we're trying to do. Um, we, everyone that we've met and worked with in recovery are super intelligent people. Um, extremely intelligent, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, and um, unfortunately, I feel the stigma has put these people into dead end jobs. Um, there is no stigma in our operation, not at all. Um, and we are working for that. That's a, thank you for pointing that out. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And as we move along, uh, if we could try to be brief, because we do want to have a discussion across the table, too. Thank you. I'm John Moinzad. I am the founder uh, and owner of Forged Modern uh, and Ventana's Sober Living. Uh, I am a designer and an artist, uh, and I am also in recovery, grateful to be in recovery. Uh, what I have done is I've transitioned what I used to do to change people's uh, atmospheres to actually changing their lives. Uh, we create a line of uh, beautiful architecturally significant furniture that is for commercial and residential use. A percentage of those proceeds go to uh, support people in their continuum of care through uh, a beautiful, rewarding sober living program uh, that's open-ended. Uh, we have a stigma-free, obvious environment, but I've had an opportunity to take uh, the relationships that I had forged uh, in my previous life as an interior designer before shifting my focus to what's really important. Uh, and I have been so uh, encouraged by those progressive uh, companies that have recognized the opportunity with these uh, brilliantly talented people. Uh, one of uh, the things that I, I uh, look at and the symbolism of, of uh, forged is that we work mostly in steel. Uh, because it's a U.S. product, but more importantly, because the process of forging something, you have to practically destroy it. Uh, and the people that come out of or are on the, uh, fortunate to be on the other side of recovery are stronger, much like steel, for uh, their triumphs and for the things that they've gone through to get there. So uh, I'm grateful to be here, uh, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to have this platform. Thank you. I'm Tyler Libby, the operations coordinator with Wiz Hope Inc. based out of Wisconsin. Um, I'm in recovery and I'm just blessed to work for a recovery, uh, recovery friendly environment that offers a great career development. I'll let Peter explain a little bit more about what we actually do. My name is Peter Renzel. I'm executive director of Wiz Hope in Wisconsin. And um, I myself am in recovery for 26 years since I was 18 years old. and. Um, through time, my passion was to simply learn how to give and be a part of that process in my everyday life. And um, one of the programs that we have created the last two years is something called Recovery Business Association. And that's where we go into employers, we teach them how to have recovery thriving culture and environment. And we also support them by with peer supports, as you mentioned. So. Hi, I'm Lisa Scheller, and I'm the founder of Hope and Coffee. And first, let me say thank you, First Lady Trump, um, Director Carroll, Dr. Adams, Larry, and everyone in this room for everything that you're doing to normalize recovery, end the stigma, and help, find, and help end this opioid epidemic. Um, the most liberating day of my life was April 1st, 1982. It's the day I entered treatment for heroin addiction, admitted that I was powerless over my addiction, and by the grace of God, I've been clean and sober for more than 38 years. I went on to get a, live a really great life, got a, a degree in engineering, I run an international chemical company, and, uh, but I was always told never tell anyone about your addiction, stay anonymous. People are gonna think bad things of you, people are gonna tell stories about you. Well, as the opioid epidemic unfolded a few years ago, I realized that I needed to take what I was told was my, my biggest liability and make it my biggest strength, and in 2018, I decided to break my, I felt compelled to break my own anonymity, and I founded a coffee shop called Hope and Coffee in Tamaqua, Pennsylvania. And as part of founding that shop, I told my, I told my story to help fundraise. Um, so Hope and Coffee is located in Tamaqua, Pennsylvania, a town that has more than 2x the, the um, national addiction rate. It's the town that I grew up in. And it is a coffee shop that employs addicts in early recovery. And as we know, these folks can't, folks like me, can't get a job because spotty employment history, criminal background, 
lack of education. Um, it's a family-friendly shop that has become the community focal point. The people who, who go there, we have also created, or I have also created a partnership with our local community college so that our baristas, who are very grateful for their sobriety as well, um, can get um, vocational training and then graduate and become part of the, the general workforce and lead clean, sober, better lives. Um, I've made it my own personal mission to elevate the cause and eliminate the stigma of being in recovery that someone in recovery can do any, can aspire to anything. Um, and this year I decided to run for U.S. Congress. So, but I'd like to say my managing, my director of Hope and Coffee is here. She's amazing and we'd like to all invite you to come to Tamaqua, Pennsylvania and see what recovery looks like uh, and how we are changing the conversation around addiction and recovery, one conversation and one cup of coffee at a time. My name is Lauren Clora. I'm the director of Hope and Coffee. I am also very thankful to be here. Thank you for having me today. Um, as Lisa mentioned, Hope and Coffee is a, is a place, a cafe that normalizes recovery and works to reduce the stigma in our small rural town. Um, we create bystander opportunities by just being a regular community cafe where anybody can come and enjoy a cup of coffee, enjoy a baked good, enjoy some live music. Um, go to a recovery-based meeting um, where we house them there. Um, we really just are a, a resource hub for our entire community. Um, so far, Hope and Coffee has employed 18 um, employees, and 16 of, of our employees are currently living still in recovery today and working successfully um, with their employers. Um, so we pride ourselves in just focusing on the fact that, um, you know, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is positive connection. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. My name is Brian Corson. I'm the founder and executive director of MVP Recovery. So we're the largest and most comprehensive recovery program in the region. We're about 15 minutes from Philadelphia. and. Uh, I come here to you today as a, as a father of three young children, as a member of the community, and specifically as a person in long-term recovery myself. Yeah, um, I'd be remiss in not to say that a little over 16 years ago, I wasn't invited to just about anybody's house. So for you to have me at the White House today, I want to thank you very much. And um, for anybody that's watching this or listening to this, if that doesn't show that recovery is not just possible, but recovery is amazing if you really stick and stay and utilize what is, what is available. And when we talk about recovery at MVP Recovery, we talk about what SAMHSA identifies as the four components of recovery, and that's health, home, purpose, and community. Those are the things that an individual needs to be in a program of recovery, and that's what we focus on. As we've identified treatment and different things like that that help people get to that point, here at MVP we identified that there was more to a obtain and maintain long-term recovery. And when we talk about purpose, employment comes so hand in hand when we talk about having a purpose. And what we were seeing is individuals in the midst of this epidemic coming into us, and they're 19 years old, and they, they have a criminal charge behind their substance use, and that felony is following them for the rest of their life. And we're telling them that anything is possible in recovery except for these certain jobs over here. And that's something that we're looking to, you know, with the, with the assistance of um, individuals like you here today to work on that because um, as everyone's talking about, when someone gets sober and someone gets in recovery, sky's the limit. And we see that every day. And when we see barriers that are put in place that is not the individual's full-on responsibility but is a consequence of this disease of addiction, we want to help support them and move them forward with that. Um, like most things, as we identified these issues, I'm sure it's the same thing here at the White House, is we identified these issues, and my wife came up with the best ideas for it. So I'm going to have her share what programs that we established here at MVP. But I want to thank you for having us here today, and thank you for your commitment to this. Thank you for having us. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Adams, Mr. Dr. Adams, Mr. Carroll, uh, First Lady Trump, and Mr. Kudlow. Um, 
as you did share, I am a person in long-term recovery, and um, as it says in the big book, you will be rocketed to the fourth dimension, but boy, this is a trip. Um, <laughs> to be here today, I'm very grateful. Um, we, as my husband said, we uh, operate MVP Recovery uh, in Philadelphia, right outside of uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And about four years ago, we started our female program. Um, and I, what I noticed was that most oftentimes in our male program, men would come in and they would have uh, the construction job to fall back on, or they would have some type of trade. Uh, when the female program opened, that was not the case. And I would see women, moms, that were trying their hardest to get back their kids, that were trying their hardest to pay their rent, um, that were trying their hardest to walk away from their past and to walk away and to really try to attack their trauma, being told no, no, you, you can't be hired here, or yes, you're hired, pending a background check. And every time they were told no, they were re-traumatized. And I came up with the thought of second chance employment. And that is essentially to give these people, and not just the women, it is now a full-on county-wide initiative, to give these people that are in recovery the chance to get a job. And once people put their, give their hope to them and give them a job, they're the, the best employees. Um, from that has stemmed second chance parenting. Um, it has, I have another initiative, Hope for the Holidays. We have so many initiatives at MVP Recovery because what we have realized through working hand in hand with individuals and being in recovery ourselves is that recovery and maintaining and obtaining long-term sobriety is a puzzle and it requires attention at every piece of that puzzle. And part of that, again, is employment and purpose. So thank you for having us here. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Dodd Wood. I'm from uh, Anderson, South Carolina. I'm a small business owner. I'm in the insulation contracting business. Uh, so I'm a small business in a small town. And it's just a blessing to be here to have opportunity to speak and, and listen to, to these wonderful stories and this group of people. And I, I just want to say that uh, it's, it's a blessing. Uh, but my, my story of recovery is I've uh, never had to be a recovery. Thank the Lord I've never had an issue with substance abuse. And I know it's a blessing. Uh, and, but I do see it. I see it every day. And I try my best to hire and, and, and promote and give the opportunity and chances to the gentlemen in our community who do have problems. And that's what I've found so many times is uh, they're, they're shut out of so many opportunities. And with what I do in the insulation contracting business, it's you know, not a very glamorous job. It's usually a, a starting point. But I try to tell the guys as I hire them to start off at this level of work that uh, you know, I'm giving you the opportunity. Show me what you can do and we'll help you find a better job as you prove yourself. And that's what I try to explain to you. Mine's the first step. Mine's the opportunity to show that you can do the work. And if you're better at it and you want a better job, I'm going to help you find If I find a better job, I'm going to take it. You know, that's what we're here for. And so that's, that's the whole idea. So I try to lead them that way, try to show them that, you know, that we do love them. You know, there's, you know, they... They're going through these problems. They think their life could be, you know, at a dead end, but it's not. They can always start over. You could end up working for President Trump at the White House. You know, that's that's how far you could go if you're if you're dedicated, and you and you want the, you know, if you if you do what you're supposed to do, you have the self-control and self-esteem to do it. But I just uh, try to give them as many opportunities as they can because. That's the biggest gift I can give them is the opportunity. If they show me they can work, I can promote them as far as I can promote them. But most of all, I can help them find their next step, their next job, and hopefully have them reconcile with their family or whatever it is they're trying to do because it's the most important thing. They know they can talk to me. I'm there to listen to them. Uh, we have a devotion once a week with all my guys that, if they're interested. But I just want them to know that you know it's not – this may be a, and honestly, it may be a, a bad job. It, it is. I do it, been doing it all my life. I know what a bad job. I mean, it's not fun. It's not a good one. But you have to start somewhere. Teaches you good worth that. Get your self-esteem up, and we'll go to the next step. So, thank you. 
one other thing, and I, before we um, jump to Juan, I just want, you know, talking, you know, Brian, Christine, and Don, is I know Secretary Scalia wanted to be here today from the Department of Labor, and the statistics show, I mean, this isn't just us sort of feeling it, the statistics show that employees in recovery are the best employees. They are so grateful. Um, you know, we have the opportunity to work, you know, whether it's for the President of the United States, whether it's to work, you know, for you in Carolina, um, to work at the restaurants, um, it's that opportunity, you know, to be able to, you know, start over again and have someone believe in them. And so um, the statistics show what we feel. So thank you. And we recognize that. One of the things I want folks to think about, and we won't have time to hash through all these issues um, today, but one of the things we want to know from a federal perspective is how can we help people like you? Because you've got the heart to do the right thing, but we also have to be realistic that you run an insulation company. You're not a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. You're not a, an expert on medication-assisted treatment. Uh, you're not someone who is necessarily equipped to deal with the issues that will come up uh, we know for people in recovery, but we know that those supports are available in the community. And so we want to understand what we can do to better create that connectivity between the support services that are probably already right there in your community or that we can help make available in your community and the opportunity that you're giving people so that they can be maximally successful in recovery. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hi, everybody. I'm Julie Funkhauser. I'm the co-founder and CEO of the Recovery Connection. And I just have to say, um, it is beyond an honor and a privilege to be here. And I hope I'm not the only one that was like totally nervous this morning about this. <laughs> but, but I do have to share with you, after hearing um, your story and, and, and First Lady Trump and just everybody having an opportunity to um, share words and, and meeting the folks that I've met so far. It just shows me time and time again that, um, you know, recovery is everywhere, even in the White House, <laughs> you know? And um, so I must say that I'm not, I'm not very nervous, you know, because I sense the love and I sense the authenticity and, and the um, sincerity, you know? Um, but I am a person in long-term recovery. I uh, celebrated 12 years um, back in April. And um, I'm originally from Northern Virginia. I am out in Winchester, Virginia, which I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. It's kind of out there. Um, but my, um, so the Recovery Connection is a transitional living program um, for women that struggle with substance use disorder. Um, my partner, well, she's my best friend as well, Meredith Spear. We, um, two years ago, we just celebrated our two-year anniversary of being open, um, and we are peer-based as it stands right now. We believe in, I'm a certified peer recovery specialist, and I'm a certified Narcan trainer, too. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but we believe in, in, in um, cultivating a culture of transparency. Um, you know, we, we are small right now. We're in the process of expansion um, beyond one location, and we are um, becoming residential treatment and not just, um, so we're, we're incorporating clinical services, which is very exciting. And so I'm um, looking forward to having a discussion um, in regards to at least on a state level here in Virginia, some of the challenges that we face in employing people in recovery in a clinical setting um, because oftentimes their records haunt them. And so, you know, that's uh, something that we face on a regular basis because we're in the hiring process right now. And, um, you know, I, it, I have a line out the door of people in recovery that want to work for us because they, um, they, they believe in that, that unspoken automatic empathy, you know. Um, and there's, we, we can't. Um, because there's, you know, um, legislation that, that blocks that. So, um, so I'm looking forward to having a discussion. I am also a um, mental health and recovery.